Good morning. Sorry about that, folks. I'm uh, <sighs> apparently still getting this theme all set up. So I am hoping that I have figured out a setup for my computer in which there will be no more janky video unless Twitch is being, jit Twitch is being twitchy. Um, it just meant that I needed to make some mistakes in the process. It is a Monday in which you're seeing me instead of Jillian, and I'm wearing makeup, which should tell you that there's something weird going on. And in fact, there is a press release scheduled for the top of the next hour that we will be watching together. And this particular press release is one that we don't really know as much about as we would like. Um, I'm going to work on updating the information we have and adding it to the screen. So for instance, this is live coverage of the Royal Astronomical Society press release, press conference. Now, what do we know so far? Not a lot, to be entirely honest. So, let's consider Venus. Because we can. And apparently there's a clothing company that has a jacket I really like and some shirts I really don't, also called Venus. So let's go over to the Wikipedia entry. Um, I, I can't say anything until, until they say it. I like my press credentials. Um, hello, Ciro. Oh, I'm glad that you're back. I'm glad that you're back. Um, so Venus, you can't read that. That is tiny type. I can fix tiny type. I have that ability. So let's consider Venus. Um, what I'm really interested in here is the temperature information. So its mean temperature is this information. So I'm going to add that to cr the crawler. So this is information that we know. Now, folks like David Grinspoon work on studying biosignatures, technosignatures of different types of life. And here's an article. So, in trying to understand how do we look at a world somewhere in our solar system or beyond our solar system and begin to understand um, what's going on over there, we need to know what different molecules mean. And some molecules like methane are super confusing. Methane can be produced during geologic activities. It can be produced by life. It gets broken down by the sun. So when you see methane, you have to try and figure out, is it geology? Is it biology? And we can't tell without going and exploring the world more. 
Now with Mars, we're trying really hard to understand the role of methane because we know there are seasonal variations in the methane. And this could be caused either by methane being released through melting ices like we're seeing right now on our own planet, or it could be caused by seasonally vigorous life that during the warmer weather on Mars does its biologic thing and gives off methane like life here on Earth. So methane is a really bad biosignature because it can have multiple causes. Now, in looking at Venus, I've got to say this is one world where I've had no qualms in the past saying there's no life. But then I go and I look at papers like this one from 2018 and I'm just going to read the abstract and then translate it. Um, the lower cloud level of Venus, 47.5 to 50.5 kilometers up, is an excep exceptional target for exploration due to the favorable conditions for microbial life, including moderate temperatures and pressures, and the presence of micron-sized sulfuric acid aerosols. Nearly a century after the ultraviolet contrasts of Venus's cloud layer were discovered with Earth-based photographs, the substances and mechanisms responsible for the changes in Venus's contrasts and albedo are still unknown. While current models include sulfur dioxide and iron chloride as the UV absorbers, the temporal and spatial changes in contrast... Mm, sorry, the... Uh, Temporal and spatial changes in contrasts in albedo between 330 and 500 nanometers remain to be fully explained. Within this context, we present a discussion regarding the potential for microorganisms to survive in Venus's lower clouds and contribute to the observed bulk spectra. In this article, again, one that was published in 2018, in this article, we provide an overview of relevant Venus observations, compare spectral and physical properties of Venus's clouds to terrestrial biological materials, review the potential for iron and sulfur-centered metabolism in the clouds, discuss conceivable mechanisms of transport from the surface towards a more habitable zone in the clouds, and identify spectral and biological experiments that could measure the habitability habitability of Venus's clouds. So here we have more information. So Venus has a mean surface temperature, but at an altitude, wow, I misspelled altitude, um, at an altitude of 47.5 to 50.5 kilometers, um, temperatures are approximately Sixty C, and it's one atmospheric pressure. So, what this implies is the clouds of Venus are known to be habitable. I had no idea. I'm, I, I just am learning this. Now let's look through this article and see what predictions they make. So here's, here's observations showing those changing. When they use the word albedo, that means changes in color, changes in temperature. Um, 
so you're jumping ahead in the story I am not dot dodo I think I just mispronounced your name rather horribly but I'm going to move on with my scrolling you still jumped ahead all right Um, I need tests. Let me look for the word tests. Come on, tell me what to look for. So they, they talk about transport of materials from the surface to the clouds. And this is particularly important to one, be able to raise nutrients, change the mixture, basically recycle what's going on. But another thing I'm keeping in mind that may or may not be relevant, who knows, is Venus had a temperate atmosphere up until roughly 700 million years ago. So... Yeah, it's possible that life that could have existed 700 million years ago mostly got killed off in what horrific event caused Venus to have the runaway greenhouse atmosphere that we see today. But maybe something got lofted up into that atmosphere. Yeah, astro-wise, the universe likes to prove that we are far less um, creative than the universe is. So here's an interesting picture that none of you can read. Let me see what I can do to embiggen this. Um, open image, new tab. There. So here, here's what they imagine. That there is... Um, convective mixing in the clouds and the clouds include some form of microbacteria that is capable of absorbing light out from the sun. It, it undergoes various chemical processes and thus we see chemical signatures in the atmosphere potentially. This is the question that's been raised. And this isn't the only paper like this. I, I really don't care. Um, I, I understand why they like to ask me about cookies, but unless I can eat them, I really don't care. So there is, there is this paper, um, but this isn't the only one. So here's another one from 2019 where they're looking at how do we consider Venus as a surrogate for an exoplanet? How do we treat it as though, well, let's figure out what we can do far away and try and do it nearby instead. So here's what this abstract reads. The current goals of the astrobiology community are focused on developing a framework for the detection of biosignatures or evidence thereof on objects inside and outside of our solar system. A fundamental aspect of understanding the limits of habitable environments, surface liquid water, and detectable signatures thereof is the study where the boundaries of such an environment can occur. Such studies provide the basis for understanding how once inhabitable planet might come to be uninhabitable. The archetype of such a planet is arguably Earth sibling planet Venus. Given the need to define the conditions that can rule out bio-related signatures of exoplanets, Venus provides a unique opportunity to explore processes that led to the completely uninhabitable environment by our current definition of the term. Here we review the current state of knowledge regarding Venus particularly the context of remote sensing techniques that are being or will be pursued or will be employed in the search for and characterization of exoplanets. We discuss candidate Venus analogs identified by the Kepler and Tess 
exoplanet missions and provide an update to exoplanet demographics that can be placed in the potential runaway greenhouse regime where Venus analogs reside. We list several major outstanding questions regarding the Venus environment and relevance of those questions to the understanding of atmospheres and interior structures of exoplanets. So, so here they're considering, well, we think it's uninhabitable. Let's, let's consider this in the context of other worlds. So, even scientists largely think that the interiors of these worlds play a role in the ability to construct art. Our, our understanding of the interiors of worlds are, are required for a robust understanding, but we don't have that for Venus. We know nothing about its interior. And looking at it, we can't resolve the vertical structure. We can't identify the composition of the clouds easily just by looking with telescopes here on Earth in most cases. Now, there's always ways that if we push the system, if we get lucky, we can start to do other things. And this is where some work by Sarah Seeger starts to come into play. There's been some popular level articles recently based on Sarah's work up at MIT. And um, so this is the introductory thought that matters. A team led by Sarah Seeger, an astrophysicist at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, proposes a hypothetical life cycle for how microbes might survive in Venus's atmosphere. The researchers claim they're the first to hypothesize a specific mechanism. So here we have the first half, the theory put forward. That theory um, was published in the Journal of Astrobiology on August 13th. The Venusian lower atmosphere haze is a deposit for desiccated, so dried out, microbial life, a proposed life cycle for the persistence of Venusian aerial biosphere. So here's, here's where things start to get interesting. Thank you for the sub, the way it goes. Thank you. So here's their abstract. We revisit the hypothesis that there is life in the Venusian clouds to propose a life cycle that resolves the conundrum of how life can persist aloft for hundreds of millions to billions of years. Most discussions of an aerial biosphere in, in the Venus atmosphere's temperate layers never address whether the life, small microbacterial type particles, is free floating or confined to the liquid environment inside the cloud droplets. We argue that life must reside inside liquid droplets such that it will be protected from a fatal net loss of liquid to the atmosphere, an unavoidable problem for any free-floating microbial life form. However, the droplet habitat poses a lifetime limitation. Droplets inexorably grow over a few months to large enough sizes that they are forced by gravity to settle downward to, downward to hotter, uninhabitable layers of the Venusian atmosphere. Droplet, fragment, droplet fragmentation, which would reduce particle size, does not occur in Venusian atmospheric conditions. We propose for the first time that the only way life can survive indefinitely is with a life cycle that involves microbial life drying out as liquid droplets evaporate during settling with the small desiccated spores halting at and partially populating the Venus atmosphere's stagnant lower haze layer, 33 to 48 kilometers altitude. We thus call the Venusian ha lower haze layer 
a depot for desiccated microbial life. The spores eventually return to the cloud layer by upward diffusion caused by mixing induced by gravity waves, act as cloud condensation nuclei, and rehydrate for a continued life cycle. We also review the challenges for life in the extremely harsh condition of the Venusian atmosphere. So here what we're looking at um, is at lower levels down to 33 kilometers atmosphere would desiccate and that life must then be driven up to moister layers by gravity waves. So this is where I need the standard reminder. Gravitational waves are black hole mergers. Gravity waves are atmospheric phenomena. It's very confusing. Um, the text does indeed go through my shirt. Apparently my shirt is somewhat green screened. All right, we're just going to go with this. We're just going to go with this. Um, so let me see. Actually, I'm going to see if I can fix that because that is just deeply disturbing. Um, I need to adjust this to try and get my shirt to not be entirely see-through in a way that is not how shirts are normally see-through, to be fair. Okay, I think I fixed it. We will know in a few moments. Okay, so how, how would we detect this? That becomes the question. And they're talking a lot about the importance of, of phosphorus. Phosphorus is something that is necessary for life here on Earth. It is a major... So, hey, Dr. Aaron. Um, so this is an earlier paper. This is, um, this is a paper from August. It's a theory paper on what one would need to look for. And what I love is the one-two punch of looking for what you need to see and being able to go back and say, here's where we clearly predicted this. So in this paper, what we're looking at is the importance of phosphorus is brought up all over the place. So again, this is a completely published paper. Let me get you the link. So, um, phosphorus has been detected 52 kilometers up. Um, surface X-ray fluorescence of phosphor species would have been masked by much more common silicate. So, we know there's phosphorus. We don't know to what degree, but phosphorus by itself, big whoop. It's it's how it's involved in molecules that really determines the story. Scrolling. So, so here it's getting pointed out that here on Earth, phosphate becomes an important part of the mitochondrial energy cycle. Um, this is where we start seeing uh, ATP, which is how we get energy to do everything that we do is, as life forms. Again, importantly uses phosphorus. Um, so here we're looking at the proposed life cycle where they see the desiccated life forms in the lower atmosphere getting lifted up, getting uh, moistened up for lack of a better word. Um, some things get floated away and others have the chance to continue on their life cycle. 
So here's what they write. The hypothetical life cycle of Venusian microorganisms. Cloud cover on Venus is permanent and continuous with the middle and lower layers at temperatures that are suitable for life. Um, so it goes from desiccated spores, updraft of spores transports them to a habitable layer. Spores act um, as CCN, I don't know that abbreviation, and once surrounded by liquid, germinate and become metabolically active. Those words I understand. Metabolically active microbes grow and divide within liquid droplets. The liquid droplets grow by coagulation. The droplets reach a size large enough to gravitationally settle down out of the atmosphere. Higher temperatures and droplet evaporation trigger cell division and sporulation. So it's a full life cycle. So what do we need to look for becomes the question. There's a specific word that I'm looking for and I'm not finding it. It may not be here. Let's go all the way to the end of the paper. Nope. Okay. So we're going to do, we're going to actually switch over to the broadcast that's about to go live. So folks, this is going to be the Royal Astronomical Society's um, press release. Or press conference, rather. Whoa, wrong screen. So there's currently no audio and I'm making sure that you will have audio when audio decides to be a thing. It is not currently a thing. So we're going to watch this together. Um, we're going to see what they have to say together. I will mute myself largely because I'm going to be trying to take notes and type. I am here to answer your questions throughout. Um, I like their graphic. They have a good graphic. So the next paper I was going to get to is one that came out in January of this year. Let me drop you the link. So you're going to have to copy and paste that link. Sorry, folks. So this next paper I wanted to look at, the title of the paper is Phosphine is a Biosignature Gas in Exoplanet Atmospheres. And this has many of the same authors as that paper that projected that there may be um, a life cycle in the clouds of Venus. So we've gone from looking at a life cycle in one paper to identifying in a different paper what biosignatures we could look for and saying phosphine is the molecule to look for. So here's what the abstract of this paper says. A long discussed goal of exoplanet studies is the, okay, here we go. Hopefully she's still muted. To hear the announcement of a significant scientific result from an international team. Before we kick off, I should say a little bit about the Royal Astronomical Society. We are honoured to host this press conference in our bicentenary year. Our society represents over 4,000 astronomers and geophysicists in the UK and all around the world. That international membership is a reminder that astronomy thrives as a result of cooperation beyond borders. 
It also depends on investment over many years to enable us to address the most fundamental and difficult to answer questions about our place in the universe. The 200th year has seen the final flowering of RES 200, 12 projects with external partners designed to bring astronomy and geophysics to new audiences. It is fitting, for reasons you'll hear shortly, that our first president, Sir William Herschel, had a deep interest in the solar system, and that our current president, Professor Emma Bunce, is a planetary scientist. On our panel today, we have Professor Jane Greaves of Cardiff University, Professor Sarah Seeger, and Dr. William Baines from MIT in the US, and technical expert Dr. Anita Richards from the Jodrell Bank Center for Astrophysics. They are four of the 19 authors of the Nature Astronomy paper where the research appears today, variously at the East Asian Observatory, Cambridge, Imperial College, the Open University, Royal Observatory Greenwich, the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, and Kyoto Sangyo University. Jane and the other panelists will give short presentations on their new work. There will then be plenty of time for questions directed by my colleague, Dr. Robert Massey, from journalists in this Zoom room. Also a former RAS Research Fellow. Over to you, Jane. Thank you, Phil. That nice introduction. Okay, um, let me just try and share my screen here. Yep, that looks good. Okay, so hello, Borida. Thank you for coming along to our press briefing. So myself and William and Sarah will speak to introduce the work. Uh, as Phil mentioned, Anita is also online for some technical questions. The four of us are representing our team that's having a paper published, in fact, right this moment online by the journal Nature Astronomy. The journal have very kindly agreed to make that free to access for anyone who's watching or indeed anyone in the world today. So what have we done? We're here to tell you we have detected a rare gas called phosphine in the atmosphere of our neighbor planet, Venus. And the reason for our excitement is that phosphine gas on Earth is made by microorganisms that live in oxygen-free environments. And so there is a chance that we have detected some kind of living organisms in the clouds of Venus. So yeah, I really am talking about Venus. As you probably know, the surface conditions there today are really hostile. The temperature is enough to melt our landers, for example. Um, but it's thought that much earlier in Venus history, the surface was much cooler and wetter and life could possibly have originated. Um, but conditions turn very hostile. And as my colleague Sarah will mention a bit later on, there is a long-standing theory that some of the smallest forms of life, these microorganisms, might have been able to evolve upwards into the high clouds. So conditions there are certainly not nice. They're extremely acidic and it's very windy. Um, but on the other hand, if you're talking about 50 to 60 kilometers up, um, then the pressure is much like it is at the surface of the Earth and the temperature is quite nice, maybe up to about 30 centigrade or 85 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's been hypothesized that this is a living habitat today. So I originated a project in 2016 to see if we could look, deliberately look for phosphine as a possible signature of living organisms in the high clouds of Venus. Okay, so we started with the James Clark Maxwell Telescope in Hawaii, which is operated by the East Asia Observatory, and the UK is a long-term member of the other partners there. We also then went on to use the ALMA network of telescopes down in Chile. That's operated by Europe, North America, Japan, and other partners. And I should mention, if you've got technical questions about our observations, I'm the expert on JCMT data, and Anita Richards is on an audio link to answer everything about ALMA. So what are we looking for? So Venus is a natural source of radio waves. Um, so the wavelengths we were looking at are approximately one millimeter and the radio waves originate kind of in the middle cloud layer. So if you've got a phosphine molecule above that, it can absorb that radio light and take some of it away. And that actually happens at a really specific wavelength, which is to do with the um, essentially the quantum rotation of the molecule. So they like to take that um, particular wavelength of radio light and remove it from the spectrum of Venus. 
So what we get is not uh, an image, as you might like or hope. <laughs> we just get a graph. So if there was no phosphine there, but you spread the radio light out by wavelength, you'd get a flat red line here. Um, but if you've got the phosphine present as its very specific wavelength, which is 1.123 millimeters, the phosphine molecules will have removed the radio light, and so you'll see a dip. The signal strength will go down at exactly that point. And so our colleague Hideo Sagawa, um, whom from Kyoto Sangyo University in Japan, has done the calculations which tell us for a certain number of phosphine molecules how deep this dip will be. Okay, so to cut to the chase, we have detected the phosphine, and this is the data from the telescopes. So you don't see a smooth curve like in that simulation because the data come off the telescopes digitized. So you see this kind of step graph here. But the first one we got is the discovery spectrum from the James Clark Maxwell telescope in 2017. You can see this dip in the middle. And then we were able to turn the full power of the many ALMA telescopes onto this in 2019, two years later, and we got a more detailed view of the planet's spectrum. And then you can also, again, see we have recovered this V-shaped dip at the right wavelength. So given we did this with two completely independent observatories, what we can say is with very high confidence, we have detected the phosphine on Venus. And this is very exciting and was really quite unexpected. What else can we say from the data? I can tell you from the height at which the radio waves originate, the phosphine molecules must be in that temperate zone or possibly a little bit above it. This is something we're trying to refine. And the more detailed view of the planet's atmosphere that ALMA gave us, it was able to separate different latitudes on the planet. And that told us something very interesting. So there's a long-standing idea that if there's a habitat for living microbes today, they would probably circulate in these global circulation patterns, and in particular, the Hadley cells. So they might be drifting along towards the poles and then sink before they get to the pole and come back to lower layer. And maybe they'll be most active when they're in sunlight. So these Hadley cells, north and south on the planet were thought to be a good place to look for signs of life. And what we saw is in fact where you wouldn't expect the molecules because the bacteria or microorganisms are not there. If you combine the signals from the north and south poles, we do indeed get this flat gray line. There's no phosphine there. If we combine the signals from the north and south Hadley cells, we get this very distinct in blue V-shaped dip that shows us the phosphine is strongly absorbing. So that's really encouraging. Um, what else can I tell you? Um, so from Hideo's model, we can show that the phosphine is there, but it's very scarce. So it's about 20 molecules for every billion other molecules, approximately. And what does that tell us? Well, my colleague, Paul Rimmer at Cambridge University in the UK, then used his atmospheric models. And he tried what would happen if you put a source of phosphine in this computer simulated atmosphere and let the um, chemistry of Venus work away at it. And he found that the original idea was probably not crazy. So um, the organisms wouldn't actually need to be super efficient. They could be producing phosphine at about 10% of the peak efficiency we see for real organisms known on Earth. And that would make the 20 parts per billion we see. So to me, this is really encouraging um, for the hypothesis of life. But of course, we've been really careful and we thought about it and we thought, well, maybe there's some other easy way to make phosphine on Venus. And that's what my colleague William is going to tell you uh, next. So I'll pass over control to him. Okay, thanks very much, Jane. Um, so as, as Jane said, uh, Paul's model showed that uh, phosphine was broken down at a, a known rate in Venus's atmosphere and hence had to be produced at some rate to counterbalance that breakdown. And so we spent a couple of years trying to work out what chemical processes might produce phosphine at that rate. And to do this, we had to build a network of chemical reactions that could happen in the atmosphere, um, such as down the left-hand side of the screen here, and then predict what the rates through that network would be under Venus conditions. 
Um, and so this is uh, this is a, a model of the um, uh, uh, a cartoon of Venus's atmosphere, altitude down the um, left hand side, and temperature and pressure up the right hand side. And what we're trying to uh, do here is to model the chemistry in those different layers of the atmosphere. And we've used three different approaches to do this. Um, the first is a photochemical process. As UV from the sun hits the atmosphere, it breaks the molecules up from highly reactive radicals. And those can then react with each other or with other components of the atmosphere to drive chemistry. Uh, this happens on Earth. It's what produces ozone on Earth. And it is likely to happen on Venus. So could that chemistry drive the production of phosphine? And the network we use for this is actually the one shown on the left here. And the bottom line is, no, the rate through that network is too slow by factors of hundreds of thousands to millions in order to explain the 20 parts per billion phosphine that Jane um, has observed. So that rules out photochemistry, this process of light-driven chemistry. Uh, chemicals can also react spontaneously. And so we have to explore whether that was happening in the atmosphere. Um, the way you do that is you say, what is the energy of the molecules involved? And does a reaction release energy rather than consume energy as it progresses? This is the science of thermodynamics. And so we did thermodynamics calculations on the reaction of all the known or postulated components of Venus atmosphere with each other. Um, with cloud droplets, with haze particles, with dust from the surface, uh, over 70 reactions in all, and asked, would those reactions produce the 20 parts per billion phosphine? And again, the answer was no, and not just maybe no, but it was no to within many orders of magnitude, many factors of 10. The third component is, could reactions in the rocks under the surface produce phosphine and outgas that, erupt that gas into the atmosphere? Uh, and again, rock calculations using thermodynamics suggested that, yes, volcanoes could produce tiny, tiny traces of phosphine, uh, but it will be parts per quadrillion in the atmosphere, not 20 parts per billion. So, um, so that was the, 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 the sort of obvious chemistry. Um, and then we looked at some less obvious uh, potential sources of phosphine and things like lightning. Um, or meteorites, could meteorites deliver some mineral to the surface that would then break down to form phosphine. And again, the results of all those calculations were that those sources would fall short by factors of millions or more of the rate needed to explain the observation we've got. So that really left us with, with two possibilities. Um, the first is that there's some completely unknown exotic and uh, therefore very exciting chemistry going on in the clouds of Venus that nobody has speculated on before. Or, and this is the, the more exciting one, that the phosphine is being produced by life. We did some initial calculations on the possibility it's produced by life based on the idea that the microorganisms might use chemicals similar to the ones that are in the biochemistry of Earth. So in microorganisms, in plants, in you and me. Would those chemicals be able to drive the production of phosphine under Venus conditions? And the tentative initial answer is yes, they could. So that's encouraging. The problem is that, as Jane said, the clouds of Venus are incredibly harsh. They are made up of 80% plus sulfuric acid. And that is an incredibly potent dehydrating agent. It's very corrosive. I mean, just an example, they've got a couple of snapshots of what happens if you add concentrated sulfuric acid to sugar. Yeah, why sugar. sugar. Um, and within a minute, it turns it from white sugar into this steaming column of acid charcoal. And we expect it to do the same in life forms in Venus. So it's really hard to understand how life could exist in that environment. So we've got an amazingly exciting discovery, and we've got a number of really speculative but really exciting possibilities for explaining it. Um, in that is like so many really exciting advances in science, uh, we don't quite know and we really want to find out. Um, I really want to hand over to Sarah Seeger at this point to 
put this in the context of the exciting search for life on other worlds uh, in our solar system and elsewhere. Hello. So we are not claiming we have found life on Venus. As Jane and William summarized, we are claiming a confident detection of phosphine gas whose existence is a mystery. And I just wanna reiterate what William said that phosphine can be produced by some processes on Venus but only in such incredibly tiny amounts. It's not enough to explain our observation. So we're left with this other exciting enticing possibility that perhaps there is some kind of life in Venus's clouds. So on Earth, phosphine is only associated with life, either bacteria in oxygen-free environments or as produced by humans. So you should know that phosphine exists in Jupiter's and Saturn's atmosphere because those atmospheres are dominated by hydrogen gas and also importantly, have the right temperatures and pressures lower down to create phosphine. We have to continue. Uh, we'd like to see our phosphine measurement confirmed at other wavelengths. Some team members have or are proposing to observe phosphine in the infrared with ground-based observatories, though that will be challenging because of the weak spectral features at phosphine in the infrared. We hope our work will motivate space missions that go to Venus and directly measure gases in the atmosphere. People have speculated on life in the Venus atmosphere for decades, for over 50 years actually, starting with Carl Sagan. And perhaps life originated when Venus was cooler with liquid water oceans. But as Venus heated up and underwent its catastrophic runaway greenhouse, the oceans evaporated and the surface became so hot that any life would have been killed. But life in the clouds, assuming life had been able to migrate to the clouds and live there, that life would have survived. Now, by the way, Earth has life in the clouds. Bacteria are upswept from the surface and they live freely floating in the clouds or in liquid water droplets. And life stays up there only for about a week or so. Sometimes it's transported across continents before being rained back down. Now, Earth's clouds don't last very long, but on Venus, the clouds are permanent. They cover the entire planet and they are very big uh, in vertical extent. But as William mentioned, Venus's atmosphere is incredibly harsh, so there's no real analogy with Earth. Earth. Our team has taken uh, the ideas of life in the clouds of Venus and tried to quantify it one step further. Here you're seeing the same cartoon figure of Venus's atmosphere that William showed. And you're seeing the dashed lines demarcate the so-called temperate zone, where our phosphine observations are coming from and where the temperature is not too hot, not too cold, but just right for life. The circle with the arrows depicts the life cycle hypothesis that we came up with. We argue that any life on Venus, like bacteria type particles, would have to reside inside the protective hydrosulfuric acid, even though the acid itself is incredibly harsh. Now, the life would live inside these droplets, metabolizing and reproducing, but the droplets collide. And over time of months or a year or so, the droplets would get big enough and heavy so that they would, by gravity, fall or rain out of the atmosphere. But unlike here on Earth, where the rain hits the surface of the planet, the, the sulfuric acid rain droplets would evaporate, leaving a dried out hypothetical spore that being light enough now would not fall out any further. And this haze, we, we hypothesized this uh, spore, these spores could populate a lower haze layer right beneath the Venus clouds. Now this lower haze layer is mysterious. People don't have much understanding of it, but it is long lived and very stable. After some time, this life cycle hypothesis continues that after days or months or years, for some of the spores, they will eventually be updrafted where they will absorb back in the temperate zone, absorb liquid, become hydrated, and the life cycle will continue.
human, as humans, we have wondered about life beyond Earth for thousands of years. We now know that nearly all stars have planets and astronomers have found thousands of exoplanets orbiting nearby stars. We know that rocky planets are common. A generation of astronomers is now working to enable future telescopes, observations and theory to be able to find signs of life on exoplanets far away by looking for gases in the atmosphere that don't belong. Our team has also studied phosphine gas Though it's very different than the Venus case because we would need a lot of observation time or a lot more phosphine or both. In our solar system, you know, closer to home in our solar system, there are a growing number of bodies of astrobiological interest for the search for life. We have NASA's Perseverance rover on its way to Mars to search for signs of ancient life. Jupiter's icy moon Europa is one of our best targets because of its liquid water oceans beneath its icy shell. Saturn's moon Enceladus, like Europa, has water geysers that people imagine sending a spacecraft to to fly through and look for organics. Saturn's moon Titan is actually even more interesting with liquid. Liquid is needed for all life as we know it. But Titan has liquid hydrocarbon lakes of ethane and methane. Now we have, by our phosphine gas discovery, we have raised Venus higher up on that ladder of interesting targets. And we hope that our discovery motivates focused space missions to go to Venus, to look for other gases, more gases, signs of life, and even life itself. Now I'll turn you back to our moderator. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and I believe I'm live now, which is great. So uh, I'm Robert Massey. I'm the Deputy Director of the Royal Astronomical Society, and I'll be uh, moderating the Q&A session that's following now. I should mention this is a media briefing, so we're prioritizing questions from journalists uh, in this context. But if you're watching on YouTube, you might want to be aware that there's a Twitter Q&A session tomorrow. If you follow at Royal Astrosoc on Twitter, you'll see full details of that. And also that we're doing a Reddit Ask Me Anything the following day. So there are going to be plenty of opportunities to uh, find out more about this over the coming days. Now, I'm going to operate a system where I look at the participant list and I ask you to raise your hand digitally. And I will look for that. So bear with me. And I will then uh, get my colleague Lucinda to bring you in. Um, and give you audio and video for the time that you ask your questions. So what I would ask is in a regular press conference, if we were all in the same room, is if you could say who you are and uh, where you're from. And if obviously, if you have a question for the panel as a whole, say so. And if it's directed to a particular panelist, then say that too. Um, so I can see uh, four hands up already. I'm going to start with uh, Chris Lintot. So Chris, uh, what's your question? Hello all, congratulations on a fascinating result. I want to note before I say anything else that the paper isn't currently open access and I hope that you'll post it somewhere soon so that people can, can read it. Um, my question is to you, William. I think um, the importance of this result rests on the um, chemical modeling that you've done. Um, could you say more about how you get to this result that um, the amount of phosphine that could be produced by known chemical processes is so low. Um, give us some examples of the detail into which you've gone to, to establish that result. Yeah, um, uh, only briefly as we uh, I don't have the rest of the day for the press conference, but, but yes. Um, so to uh, so take, take an example, um, if, if you want to make phosphine in the lab, uh, what you do is you take a molecule, a substance called phosphorous acid, and heat it up, and, and you get phosphine. Um, so the, the question is, um, could, you, could that be happening in the clouds of Venus? And so what you, what you can do is work out for the clouds of Venus, for the different gases in there, what would the reaction be to turn phosphoric acid, which is the form we think is present in the clouds, which is the most stable form of phosphorus, into phosphorous acid um, at a high high altitude where it will be stable, and then it would fall to a lower altitude um, where it's where it'd be less stable and will break down. Um, 
and you do those calculations thermodynamically. So you know the energy of phosphorous acid, phosphoric acid, the gases you would have to react to make those, those reactions happen and so on. Um, and you work out therefore how much phosphorous acid there is. And that comes out about um, 44 milligrams or about the weight of three grains of rice um, for the whole of Venus. Okay, the, the, um, this is not per drop, this is across the entire planet. And so you could say, well, that's you know, far, far less than the amount you need to explain um, the phosphine. Uh, it's, it's those sort of calculations. Then you have to go through that for every, all the possible combinations of reactions and combinations of materials that, that you can think of. It's, it's, it's quite an exhausting process. And I must confess, it gets at times a bit tedious because one's chemical intuition says, yeah, of course, but, but you have to prove it, don't you? Okay, in case you're wondering, uh, the shuffling between Jane and myself is because we're in the, in the same room obeying the rules on social distancing. So uh, I can see uh, plenty more questions coming in now. So the next one I'm going to take is from uh, Hobart Schilling. And Hobart, when you come in again, if you could say, uh, you know, who you're writing for or, or reporting for. And obviously then if you have a person you want to direct the question to. You may need to unmute yourself. I think Lucinda will give you the uh, authorization to do that or switch on your video if you choose. Is this okay? Yes, we can hear you. That's great. Go okay. ahead. Uh, I'm Hovart Schilling. I'm a freelance astronomy writer in the Netherlands. My question is for Sarah. Um, about a year ago, you co-authored this paper on phosphine as a significant biomarker. I have actually two questions. The first one is, when you wrote that paper, were you already aware of these Venus observations? And my second question is, uh, are we able at all to make similar detections on uh, Earth-like extrasolar planets? Sure, well, I'm glad you asked that question because our story is a fascinating, unique story in science. Professor Jane Greaves was working on phosphine completely independently to my team. Dr. William Baines, he was interested in phosphine on his own since the 1990s. We wrote a series of three papers, including the one you mentioned. And as word got around about our papers, a mutual contact linked us with Jane's team. Now, most of you hadn't heard of phosphine. It's so obscure. No one cares about it except for a few very niche people. And both Professor Jane Greaves and William and Janusz Bitkowski and my team, we came across the same obscure papers talking about how phosphine is associated with life. So we got put together in this sort of really happy connection. And no, it actually wasn't related. We had started our phosphine as a biosignature gas in 2015. And as Jane mentioned, she started her work in 2016. So Jane and I did know each other from like, I don't know, the beginnings of exoplanets, but we never would have crossed paths because our work was so different. Now about your question as phosphine as a biosignature gas. So my team is going through like every gas that could be potentially a biosignature gas on exoplanets, but they're all turning out to be incredibly challenging. Our paper, as if you read it, it says the one on phosphine for exoplanets, it could take many, many hours, tens or even a hundred hours of the James Webb Space Telescope time. And it's quite a weak feature unless life figures out a way to re-engineer the atmosphere with phosphine gas. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next one I'm going to take is from uh, Kimberly Cartier. So again, uh, Kimberly, if you can uh, introduce yourself and uh, direct a question to one of the panelists, or, or all of them, if you prefer. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we're hearing you well. Great, thank you so much for taking my question and such a fascinating discovery. Um, uh, my question is about how long phosphine lasts in Venus's atmosphere at the at this particular cloud level. Do we have any idea of that? And from that, can we tell whether the phosphine is produced all the time or if it's more sporadic? That'll be William. Um, yeah, really good question. Um, the lifetime is not that well constrained. It depends on the uh, concentration of the uh, uh, reactive radicals generated by photochemistry. And that itself depends on some details of the Venetian atmosphere that are not that well known. We are talking about um, sort of in, in near the top of the clouds, sort of um, thousands of seconds, that sort of range, um, going down to 
deep underneath the clouds would be very much longer than that. And how much longer is, is very poorly constrained. Um, so uh, the, so how is, is it likely to be produced so periodically? It could be, um, but it's not, it, it's not sort of going to be produced in short bursts and then hang around for a long time. Um, it could be produced, you know, on a sort of hourly cycle or something. Uh, but then beyond that, it's really hard to say. I think something I'd add to that is the super rotation of the atmosphere. Um, so gas particle being carried around completely the planet in about four Earth days. So some of the signatures we're looking for, even if they're produced by a little colony of microbes or some local source, they might get very smeared out very quickly. Thanks, Jane. Okay, the next one we have is from uh, Matt Kaplan. And again, Matt, if you can introduce yourself, we'll bring you in. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, this is Matt Kaplan. I'm the host of Planetary Radio for the Planetary Society. Congratulations on, uh, first of all, these, this marvelous discovery. Uh, this question is really for any of you or all of you. Um, you talked about how you hope that this result will increase the interest in uh, returning a mission to Venus. What sort of mission would you like to see that would be best capable of investigating further this layer of the atmosphere where uh, this activity may be taking place? So, Jane, do you want to take that as the lead off? I think I might direct that to Sarah, if that's okay with you, Sarah. Well, as you may know, there has been a lot of mission planning and mission thinking for many years, actually. And right now, there are two missions under the NASA Discovery class. They're under a phase A competition right now. So we'd like to see really any, ki any kind of mission go back to Venus, something that's capable of measuring gases in the atmosphere, something that has a so-called mass spectrometer that can identify like larger complex molecules that could only be associated with life. We, uh, we have a long list of things we'd like actually, perhaps ultimately we could send a microscope. This is tougher actually because cells uh, are spherical and or they may be confounded with hazes and other aerosols and atmospheric particles. So it's like the missions that are being planned, but focused on signs of life detection and life detection itself. Just to add to that, I think it is very exciting. Japan have got an orbiter at the moment. India have plans to launch one. Um, Europe has longer term plans. We're really hoping somebody or maybe, you know, private space industry, somebody might take this up. Would you like to see a balloon, as has been proposed in the past, that might actually reach into this layer of the atmosphere? A balloon is certainly the best way. And the Vega balloons did just that. They were, they lasted a couple days. They were, you know, tens of kilograms, low tens of kilograms. And that's the kind of thing we'd like to see happen again. Perhaps a super version of those that instead of lasting two days could last weeks, months, even a couple of years. Thank you. I can see a huge number of questions coming through, which is no great surprise. So uh, the next one I'm going to take is from uh, Clive Cookson, if that's okay. So Clive, if you're there, or get ready to switch on your mic. Great. Thanks very much indeed. I'm Clive Cookson, the Financial Times science editor. I was wondering, this is probably for William, whether you've done any calculations to show how abundant the microbes would be if they exist to produce um, phosphine at the rate required, given how long it lasts or doesn't last, its destruction rate, its abundance, the, the abundance of the um, of the gas. If I could how slightly jump in, um, so the ten percent I mentioned is um, they could either be all over, all through the clouds, um, working at about ten percent of. Um, peak Earth productivity, or they could perhaps occupy 10% of the volume of the clouds, but be um, the really peak producers. But I think William has got a more um, concrete answer to that. Uh, yeah, thank, well, not really, Jane. Um, <laughs> the 10% the, the assumes that the organisms are producing uh, phosphine at the same sort of rate as they do in some specific ecologies on Earth. Um, which are anaerobic, so there are no um, atmospheric oxygen in them, and are fairly phosphorus rich, so there are a lot of phosphate uh, mineral in them. 
um, but that is specific to Earth metabolism. So if the same metabolism is happening at the same rates in Venus, then yeah, you're talking about um, you know, so 10% of the clouds or something. Whether that means 10% by volume or by area is not entirely clear yet. And that has the huge assumption that the Venusian microbes, if they exist at all, have metabolisms um, similar to Earth's. And the one thing we know about them is that they probably don't. So it's, it's really hard to say. I just like to say, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. What's embedded in William's comments from this and a prior question is that there's a lot about the atmosphere we don't know. You know, we'd like to measure every gas and the radicals, the, the gases that destroy phosphine. We don't know those in detail as a function of altitude. And so it's hard to sort of run through all the exact numbers for a hypothetical life form. We have no idea if it's there or how it works. And it's really um, uh, made harder because we don't know enough about the chemical con exact chemical constituents of the atmosphere. We're hoping to measure the distribution of phosphine um, in sort of area across the planet and depth into the atmosphere um, as soon as ALMA comes online again. But of course, um, we need to respect the need of the telescope staff to stay safe in the pandemic. So, um, you know, stay tuned for that one. Okay, I can see that you can't be quantitative, but qualitatively, surely there must be quite a lot of these microbes to produce the signal that you've observed, mustn't there? I mean, they couldn't be very rare well, organisms. It, it, I guess that's a question. It's unlikely to be... ...to pack the organisms are in the colonies on um, Earth, which is not a question I know the answer to. So, William... Um, yeah, it's it's not really a question that even people on Earth have an accurate answer to for um, for environments on Earth, uh, where you can actually go there and take up you know, buckets of, of stagnant swamp and look at the microbes in them, and people still can't say precisely which microbes are making phosphine and which are, um, um, and uh, in detail how they do it. So there are a huge number of unknowns here. Um, yes. The, the, this is not going to be, you know, one tiny patch a few meters across somewhere drifting in the cloud producing phosphine. Um, it's it's going to it's going to be fairly widespread in the sense it will be spread across the planet. But whether it is um, spread across in in one narrow band of latitude or quite widely in latitude, uh, in altitude, uh, we really have no way of even guessing at the moment. And, and this is why having more data on the distribution of, of gases and phosphine so important. Journalists love to push us to speculate, but it's not really something we can do right now. Yeah, I'll pass you back for the next question, I think. Okay. Thanks, Jane. I'm going to try and do it out of shot so with a, a different laptop. So <laughs> Sorry, we're dancing around the uh, precautions here. <laughs> exactly, yeah. This is, this is life in the pandemic. So I can see, I think, a number of questions coming here. I'll take one from Ethan Siegel. If you're, if you're there, I can see your hands raised, uh, and we'll bring you in now. Hi, this is Ethan Siegel. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Go ahead, Ethan. I think you've muted yourself. Uh, Hang on, am I am I still unmuted? Okay. You're, you're fine now, we can hear you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Thank you for taking my question. Um, one of the things, uh, Sarah, you brought it up, and I think, William, you might uh, know a little more about it, but anyone can answer this. Um, one of the things that I like to think about when it comes to this is, okay, uh, alien life would be like really a fantastic explanation for this, but boy, you really have to rule out all the mundane ones first. And I was going to ask you a question about Jupiter and Saturn. We see large amounts of phosphine in interesting ways on Jupiter and Saturn, right? We see that it's abundant. It's We think it's produced in the high pressure environments uh, with hydrogen at high densities that we don't achieve on other planets. Um, we see the density is dependent on latitude, temperature conditions, solar radiation received. Um, Venus, of all the non-gas giant planets, has the most gas giant-like atmosphere in a lot of ways. Um, can we really be confident, because I, I have, I'm not an expert on this, um, can we really be confident that there isn't some atmospheric process that is producing this phosphine completely abiotically? 
Um, are we really confident in how these gases and how phosphine is produced on Jupiter and Saturn? And we can absolutely rule out that it's not happening the same way on Venus. Can, can you speak to that, please? Yeah, I'll speak briefly first, then turn it over to William. So first of all, we are extremely confident that phosphine is not produced on Venus. It is still not comparable to Jupiter and Saturn in terms of temperature, pressure, and hydrogen. You know, we have this 100-page paper we're posting that will show you all possibilities. However, you're right, never say never. There could always be something we overlooked. So I want to kind of go back to science. You know, we're putting this result out there. We're expecting it to generate more work. But ultimately, the only thing that will answer this question for us, is there life, is there not life, is actually going to Venus and making more detailed measurements for signs of life and maybe life itself. William? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right, Sarah. Uh, I, I'm, and, and your question is entirely, entirely correct. You know, in order to make this quite extraordinary claim that there might be life there, we really have to rule everything out. And that's why we're very cautious to say we are not claiming there's life, we're claiming there's something that is really unknown and it might be life. Um, as to Jupiter, we are, we are in versus Venus. Um, uh, we, are, we are very confident that the Jupiter process is not happening on Venus. In order for that chemistry to happen, you'd have to have um, thousands of atmospheres pressure of hydrogen gas. And there is uh, almost no hydrogen atoms, never mind hydrogen gas, in the atmosphere of Venus and, and by inference below the surface. So that particular chemistry is definitely not happening on Venus. Is there some unknown chemistry that's happening there producing phosphine? Well, by definition, if it's unknown, we don't know. And I, 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 I'd love to be able to say I have rigorously, you know, we, the team, have rigorously ruled out every possible form of chemistry. Uh, we've only ruled out what we, as a team, and all the referees that have reviewed the papers and several other people we've talked to have thought about or speculated about. There might be something we don't know, and that's why going there and looking for it is so important. But just to wrap that up, we know there isn't abundant hydrogen in the upper atmosphere of Venus because the other chemistry would also be completely different from what we expected. And JCMT and ALMA have been doing this for years and decades, so we would know. Okay, I think uh, Robert Great. can okay. take another question. All right, I'll take uh, one now. I think I've got a Nikolai Guaronin. I think you, I remember you registering for the briefing earlier on today. So Nikolai will bring you in now. And again, if you could say where you're from, if you, who you're writing for, or which agency or, or outlet, that would be great. Hello, uh, I'm a science reporter for the BBC Russian Service. And as a science reporter for the BBC Russian Service, first of all, congratulations on your discovery. Uh, you. the, the observations made on Venus were mostly made, as um, press release mentioned, with um, Vega, the Soviet um, orbiter and the Soviet lander. And you, you mentioned the balloons. Now, Russia is preparing another mission to Venus, which is called Venera D. Uh, have you been in touch with them, and will those discoveries be somehow proved by that mission? We would love to be in touch with them. Haven't so far, because this has all happened in a big rush. We were um, doing all the calculations um, for the paper. Um, but if someone can put us in touch, that would be fantastic. You know, and I, I do appreciate the the enormous technical effort that went into getting the Vega 2 lander down through a long voyage through the clouds onto the surface in 1985. Um, our only independent measurement of um, basically essential raw phosphorus in the atmosphere comes from that lander. So it would be great to connect with that historic effort as well. So as a follow up, uh, have you discussed any orbiters or landers uh, on Venus with, uh, with these new discoveries? It's been too soon for me, certainly. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can we go to, I'm um, looking at people who've been waiting a while, so can we go to uh, Rick Lovett? Thanks. Am I there? Yeah. Hello? Hi, Rick. Okay. Rick Lovett, I'm freelance, uh, writing uh, for Cosmos Magazine in Australia. Some of what I wanted to ask has been answered. Uh, sort of. I'm interested in what we know of the earthly organisms and the type of biochemistry that produces this. Um, not so much because it's because uh, it might exist, be duplicated on Venus, but just who, what are they? That's probably Sarah, right? <laughs> well, I can start. I mean, right now, 
It's a good question, actually, because we don't know exactly which life form on Earth produces phosphine. You know, there's, in, I personally am 100% convinced that life on Earth produces it, as are many, many people. But it looks like it's some kind of strain of E. coli, but we don't know. And the biologists also don't know the exact biochemical pathway that makes phosphine. We hope that our work is going to motivate pushing that research along. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, I, I could see there was a hand going up and down. It might be a connection issue for Pamela Gay. So if you're, if you're there and you want to ask a question, just raise your hand and we'll bring you in. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to go to... Oh, her hand oh, there is, is up. Go, yeah. go, Come on then, Pamela, let's bring you in. I know you've been there on and off for a while. And you should be able to speak now. Hi, this is the pa this is Pamela Gay from the Daily Space at the Planetary there, Science Institute. Uh, do you have okay, telescope well, we can time? Try and come back to you if you're if you're not uh, coming in, so I'll, I'll bear you in mind. Um, okay, so I'm going to go to uh, Christian Reddy, I think next. Christian. No? You should be able to speak now, uh, Christian. But we're not hearing you. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can. Yeah. Go okay. ahead. If you could you speak very really loudly, I'm struggling a bit with lecture theater here. Of course, of course. Well, first of all, congratulations on an amazing uh, and, and uh, provocative result. Um, yeah. What I'd like to ask is, uh, I think uh, Sarah uh, was talking about this earlier, about other ways of confirming this. So you've already had the discovery signal. You've had confirmation from ALMA. What additional confirmations or potential biomarkers would you hope to see uh, detected? Uh, short of, of course, descending into the clouds and picking up a, you know, a Venusian fly or something like that. What, what else would you hope to uh, detect? Who would like to take that? Uh, Sarah, I think, perhaps? Well, we haven't given really that too much thought right now. As Jane said, we've been so busy just getting this, this result done. I think it's tough to, I mean, it's a good question for Jane to answer of what can we observe at radio wavelengths? A lot of these molecules- uh, um, Sorry, Sarah, carry on. <laughs> in the infrared, it's really tough to make observations um, of Venus's atmosphere. So there have been predictions of um, sulfur molecules that could be involved in a life cycle. And we did originally intend to observe those. Um, but the expert advice from people more experienced in Venusian chemistry with a um, bio signatures involving sulfur would be a small component of the overall very complex and not very well understood um, sulfur chemistry network. Um, so anything we got would be more ambiguous. So the point of doing the phosphine um, was to try and remove a lot of the ambiguity. But yeah, I would love if people tell us um, other biomarkers of anaerobic bacteria, for example. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Christine. Okay. Uh, I'm going to bring in uh, some of the other people's names I've seen for a while. I can see Pamela's back again, but I'll try Andrew first. Andrew Law. Again, if you could say uh, where you're from, that would be great. Uh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Thank you very much for uh, taking my question. Um, I've got uh, two parts, really. Um, one, I'd like to ask about the time frame for this whole thing. Um, if I understood correctly, you mentioned that this work started back in 2016. And obviously there will have been a portion of observation and verification first, and then presumably a follow-up or a period where um, you would have been studying the, um, uh, the abiological processes that might have led to this. Um, can you talk roughly about how that time frame looks between 2016 to now and whether the processes overlapped at all? And secondly, are you aware that Peter Beck, the CEO of Rocket Lab, is interested in sending a mission to Venus? Thank you. I won't address the Rocket Lab part, but I can talk about the, um, the time frame part. So I came up with this idea um, because I'm a long term astrobiologist and a millimeter wave astronomer, which is probably an unusual combination. So this idea sort of sprung on me in um, January 2016, and we did spend quite a lot of time um, getting telescopes to realize we had a idea that wouldn't waste a lot of their time. So we got the um, JCMT observations with enormous help from their staff who are um, the authors on the, at the end of the list on the paper. We got those in June, 2017, when that was all set up. Um, took about 18 months to convince ourselves there was a signal. 
um, then immediately applied to Alma, who kindly gave us um, some special time in the director's remit. Uh, that was kind of dicey because the Alma configuration was okay, but we had to grab it within about a couple of weeks and they had a short unexpected period of bad weather and that kind of thing. So that was March 2019. And then, as you said, um, we have spent substantial time um, doing the calculations so about a year from that and refining the paper. Does that answer um, what you were after? I'll continue. So um, I just want to back up for a moment and say to Jane's credit, astronomers and scientists in general almost never do this. She decided to search for life on Venus. She dug through the literature and found this very obscure gas that would be a unique biosignature. She proposed to the telescope, initially got rejected, persevered, and then succeeded. And I just want to say, I think I recall that the MIT folks, we connected with Jane two years ago. And that's when, in particular, Dr. William Baines and Dr. Anish Petkowski, they ramped up on all those calculations that we're, we're talking to you, that, that William was describing. Yeah, it's really helped to have a very diverse team, just people who have not met before, but were willing to share expertise. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Now we're coming to the last uh, 10 minutes of the briefing. We need to finish around five to accommodate some other uh, requests. So I was thinking we should take uh, Jennifer Millard next and then I will bring in uh, Pamela if the audio is working. Go ahead, go ahead, Jennifer. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. And, yeah. and say where you're from and who your question's for. Yes. Excellent. Uh, so I'm Jennifer Millard. Um, I'm representing the Awesome Astronomy podcast and also Sky Guide, um, which is an app available in the App Store. I just want to say a massive congratulations, um, especially to Jane. Woo! -hoo! This is brilliant. Um, Thank you, Jenny. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I you know I've been losing sleep over this because I've been so excited. I don't know what it must be like for you guys. Um, so I have uh, a couple of questions. One of them is a more kind of sciencey question. The other one's just a bit of fun speculation. Um, my first question is, uh, Jane, in your talk, you mentioned that Venus is a natural radio source. Um, where does that radio radiation come from? And then my second question is, assuming that um, the phosphine is produced by life, um, could it be that this life maybe came from Earth and went to Venus, or maybe at some point in the past, like the other life, traveled from Venus to Earth, maybe the life could be connected. And I know that's a total speculation question, just a bit of fun. I'll take just the first question then. So um, what we call the, the broadband um, natural radio waves from Venus, they're actually a mixture of um, emission from molecules deeper down in the atmosphere that produce these really wide um, sort of um, features all across that graph. Um, so if you looked very closely at the one I showed you, you could see it's not a flat red line we were expecting without phosphine. It's actually slightly angled. And that's because it's a blend of these broad sort of <laughs> shallow waves, if I can put it that way, across the spectrum. So the dominant molecules, things like carbon dioxide, um, create the um, radio waves that are the um, kind of featureless background in wavelength against which we see the much narrower absorption lines from the upper atmosphere. Um, I'll pass over to uh, one of the others for your um, so we'll just answer, say, just Sarah. To in, just to fill in one more thing is, so, you know, Venus is heated by the sun. It has a tiny amount of its own internal energy, but the sunlight gets completely reprocessed and it gets spit out at longer wavelengths like the radio. And I'll just let William, but I'll just say, so these sulfuric acid droplets, as William showed you that picture of sugar, what happens to it, it's terrible for all of our own Earth life types like our amino acids, proteins, DNA would completely dissolve inside these droplets. So it probably has to be a completely different kind of life that probably didn't come from here if that life is even there. Unless life had some protective shell of wax or graphite or, or sulfur or something like that. William? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's a really good question. And people speculated um, along these lines with respect to Mars, did uh, life was life on Earth um, in the early days of the solar system, ejected from Earth and colonized Mars, or indeed did life arise on Mars and colonize Earth. And you can make the same sort of arguments for Venus. I think it's a bit harder for those for transfers to happen um, from Earth to Venus, because Venus is close to the sun, so the orbital dynamics don't work quite so well, but I'm, I'm not an expert in that. But yes, it could happen um, in principle. The, the problem, as Sarah has, has said, that the cl these clouds are such a strange environment so it's so different from the terrestrial environment that it's hard to see how life could 
evolve and adapt to um, uh, to go from a, uh, a life that could be happy in, on Earth, which essentially is in water, to life that could survive in sulfuric acid. Uh, but it's a really important question because uh, at, at the moment we only have one example of life we know in the entire universe, and that's the example of life on Earth. And if we could find one example of life that had originated elsewhere, so wasn't originating on Earth and transferred to Venus, then that will be a profound sort of philosophical importance in proving that there could be life elsewhere in the universe that is not dependent on life on Earth. And, and that would just be amazing. I just wanted to add a couple things um, to answer the past questions. About the biosignature gas, I didn't answer that one really that well. We have a long list of biosignature gases. We have methane and nitrous oxide and we have other gases like ammonia or methyl chloride. We have a long list but many of those are very hard to see from Earth into the Venus atmosphere because A, they may be tangled together or carbon dioxide may be blocking them. And as Jane said, they're not available at these more favorable microwave wavelengths where the molecules are more spread out and have fewer contaminants. If we could go to Venus, then you can amplify the signal um, by an instrument that bounces light back and forth, back and forth, like millions of times inside a little instrument to amplify the signal. Now about Rocket Lab, <laughs> yeah, they want to go to Venus. We have been talking to them. They're um, amazing to be so flexible. And Rocket Lab's spacecraft would be only be about 15 kilograms and they would reserve about three kilograms or so for a payload. So we have to work hard to make sure an instrument that would be useful for the search for life will fit into that, that payload and we're really looking forward to it. I think that's a challenge there. I think um, we're gonna go on to take one more yeah, question. I'll, I'll let I Robert go ahead with that. Absolutely. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, we've got time for one more. We've got about two minutes left, so maybe a, a quick question and, and snappy uh, answers, which I know is always an impossible ask in these sessions. Um, so I'm going to try Pamela again. Pamela Gay, if you're there, if you can come through, let's, let's see if we can hear you this time. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. yes, we can. Hi, this is Pamela Gay from the Daily Space at the Planetary Science Institute. I, is this a signature that you'd be capable of detecting on the night side of Venus? And is there any reason to think that there'd be variation between the day side and the night side? Uh, I think that's for Sarah. I was going to let you answer it, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Not in the millimeter wave signal, but I think um, there's some faults about the infrared signal because the detectability um, it varies on the um, uh, light and dark side. Okay. Um, right, I think I should uh, okay. wind it up there. Unless any of the other panelists want to answer that point, then I think uh, we should wind it up here. Um, I very much appreciate the time the panelists have given, or my colleagues who are invisible in this uh, this session, like the Cinder Offers, they're busy managing the whole thing so that we actually made it work. Uh, and my, my other colleagues at the World Astronomical Society and in the different associated institutions in Hawaii and the US and, uh, and the, uh, across the UK. So uh, with that, it's been a great pleasure. If you want to find out more about this, we will have things, if you're watching as a member of the public as well, we will have things I can explain a video on our website. Obviously, there's a lot of those on our partners, at, um, particularly at MIT and ESO as well. And so do look for those too. They should be live now. I believe the paper is live and available now as well, or if it isn't uh, ready now, then very, it should be very soon. So uh, thank you once again. Um, I'll also point you again to our Twitter account at World Astrosoft, where you can see the Twitter chat tomorrow and the Reddit Ask Me Anything on Wednesday. And now I think uh, Jane and the others probably have to go and talk to other members of the media. So um, they, they, it's not over for them yet, nor should it be really. I think it's been a fantastic uh, session. So thank you to everybody. And I guess we'll leave it there. So. Have a nice uh, evening, everybody. All right. So there is the awkward ending of the press conference. I'm going to go ahead and close this out. And I, I don't know what to do from here in terms of my brain is somewhat over full. So... I'm going to answer a question real fast on Twitter by saying, um, we'll have Sarah Seeger. I'm trying to figure out what her Twitter is. I'm completely missing what her Twitter is. Um, we're going to have Sarah Seeger on this Thursday. There she is. Um, so she'll be coming on the daily space.
So hopefully Sorry, I'm typing a question. So um, I'll, um, and I'll be asking her about seasonal and day night changes. Um, so um, I'm gonna be asking her these questions if they still make sense after I read the nature paper let's go look at that paper. So here is the nature website and it's nature astronomy actually that I'm interested in. View all nature research journals. Um, okay so apparently nature astronomy is under N. There we go. So this is a um, regular issue and their lead sport stories phosphine gas in the cloud decks of Venus. I'm going to go ahead and download the PDF um, and I'm going to make sure I save this. I'm going to try and make sure that I save this. Why don't you want to let me save as? File. That's deeply confusing. I'm going to send it to my printer upstairs. Maybe. Doesn't want to let me do that either. Good Lord. Nature, are you blocking all of these functions? They do that sometimes. File. Print is blocked. Okay, I will need to figure that out later. All right, so going through this article. Um, so their basic results are that phosphine with a 1-0 rotational transition at 1.123 uh, millimeters wavelength was detected with the, was looked for in the James Clerk Maxwell telescope that's in Hawaii um, in June 2017. Why is that page blank? Hi. I would like the rest of this article, please. Apparently I'm not allowed the rest of the article. All right, let's try and read it on the website. So here we go. Um, so it was sought in the observation um, over five months in June, 2017, a single point spectra over the whole planet, limb down weighted by 50% within the telescope beam. Absorption lines from the cloud deck were sought against the quasi-continuum created by overlapping broad emission features. So basically what this is saying is there's lots of different spectral lines that are being caused by effects at different depths in the atmosphere. And so they're trying to tease out a particular um, vibrational state in the phosphine molecule that they know is creating absorption lines and it's not easy. Um, so, so collective, it, it's not. Nature blocks a lot of those things. Um, it's quite annoying. Um, Okay, so the main limitation is it's just not that deep a line. So 
so but they were able to see it so this right here this little tiny blip that's the spectral line and here's where they're fitting it so they saw the one to zero which is one of the vibrational states i believe um Signal to noise was three to seven, so that's enough to say, yes, that's there. So then they went and they used the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, which is much better suited for doing this. And here you can see the much deeper line, or no, it's not a deeper line, the much better resolved line. Um... Oh, this is interesting. So Carolyn Porco is not pleased with this result. Um, so, so this is interesting. So Professor Lee Cronin um, writes, I think we might need to teach some astrobiologists a bit of inorganic and physical chemistry, starting with heats of formation and Hess's law to leap from, we have found phosphate, phosphane to life must make it with our understanding the surface of Venus and thermochemistry seems wild. So, so here we have geologists saying that they can't make the claims they're making without a better geological understanding of Venus and Carolyn Porco adds to this. Um, in other words, phosphane, which is easy to make geochemically, does not suggest life any more than finding any other geochemically common substance like methane. Um, that's interesting given, um, this has gone through peer review. So you would have thought that they brought in someone with, um, the correct understanding. So phosphine, P-H-I-N-E. Um, and yes, there is a difference. They're different. Uh, so phosphane and phosphine, I believe phosphane is the name of the group. So molecules that contain, I think, this is me going back, chemistry is not my strong suit. Um, they're referring to phosphine, which is phosphate with three hydrogens attached. Sorry, which is phosphorus with three hydrogens attached. Um, so yeah, they made it clear that it's the amounts that mattered. Um, So I'm still going to enjoy being a spectator on this and trying to, trying to ask intelligent questions. Um, trying to ask questions. Um, so this journal article is only available for today. This is important and annoying information. Um, so I want to see what this says. Because uh, I don't know what the graph on the right is. Spectrum of the whole planet with one sigma errors. Right, spectra of the polar histogram in black, mid latitudes in blue, and the equatorial in red regions. So the phosphine seems to be found at mid latitudes. That's fascinating. Okay. I'm going to screen capture this because I don't trust nature. I need to renew my subscription is what I need to do. So I don't have to worry about this stuff, but it's expensive. It's like a $200 subscription. Oh, um, yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. Anodyne quinine. I think that's how you say your name. Um, but Yeah, we're always so segmented in, in astronomy. So here's the whole planet spectra across the full pass band common to both data sets. I don't know what to do with this information. Um, I'm going to need to read this whole paper and it's going to need to be something I don't do while online. 
Um, so they're looking for contamination from another line. And one way to do this is to look for a different place in the spectra where a different um, line related to that transition exists. And um, that will tell you how much you expect the interfering, how big you expect the interfering line to be. All right. They were unable to find another chemical species besides pH 3 that can explain the observed features. So conclude the, content, the candidate detection of pH 3 is robust. All right, so this is all about the detection of the pH 3. Um, predicted maximum photochemical production in pH 3 found to be insufficient. So the interaction of sunlight and the chemistry existing in the atmosphere is insufficient is what they're saying. Um, um, oh, Moo Hoodles, I love that paper, please. Um, it's not known if no known chemical process co processes can explain phosphine within the upper atmosphere of Venus, then it must be produced by a process not previously considered plausible. This could be unknown chemistry, geochemistry, or life. Information is lacking. As an example, the photochemistry of the Venusian cloud droplets is almost completely unknown. Hence, a possible droplet phase photochemistry source for phosphine must be considered. Um, I'm going to search on the geo. To further discriminate between unknown photochemical or geological processes as the source of Venusian phosphine or to determine whether there is life in the clouds of Venus, substantial modeling and experimentation will be important. Ultimately, a solution could come from a revisiting Venus for an in situ measurements of aerosol return. So they do look at the geology. Let's see what else they have to say. Um, and then the rest of these are all. So um, geologic data is 8 to 15 orders of magnitude too high to support reduction of phosphate. So out gassing a mantle rocks would produce only trivial amounts of pH 3. So they did look at the geology and the amounts aren't consistent. So what we're going to see today is a whole lot of hot takes on Twitter by people who haven't made it through the paper yet, but are determined to have a hot take. Um, and people are already cheerleading their favorite spacecraft. Um, so let's see what all is going on. Um, thank you for the paper, Moo Hoodles. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> Rambler, that's a good thing. Um... So Nick Howes, Nick Astronomer, is pointing out that when the Square Kilometer Array and other megascopes pick up interesting signatures on exoplanets, um, as one day they probably will, that hope would humanity, what hope would humanity have of doing follow-up? So, so this is an interesting quandary of if we can't definitively say whether or not phosphine on Venus is a biosignature or chemistry, um, how do we use phosphine or any other molecule to identify life on other worlds? So this is, this is where we're at. Um, 
Oh, oh, Ciro, I'm sure we will have the papers that scream that. I mean, in, as far as astronomy gets, the title on this, oh, not the title on this, the title on other papers has been very clear. So the, the abstract on this screams as much as any abstract can, can scream. Um, so this is the key line. Phosphine could originate from unknown photochemistry or geochemistry or by analogy with biological production of phosphine on Earth from the presence of life. Um, that's really as screaming as it gets. So yeah, this is, this is where we're at. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> Arc, I am sure that there will be plenty of, uh, people speculating wildly like that. Um, Oh man, Curly and Porco is super active right now on Twitter. Um, oh man, so Astrowise asks, so is phosphine a good biomarker to look for anything we, um, to look for anywhere we're looking for life as opposed to say methane? Um, okay, looking for the Dr. Funky Spoons tweet thread next. Um, so phosphine is good for identifying anaerobic life. So if you're looking at a planet that doesn't have free oxygen molecules, so it doesn't have O2 in the atmosphere, then phosphine is reasonable as a biomarker. Um, that, that limitation of, um, sorry, I failed to click correctly. That limitation of it being a biomarker for anaerobic life means that we need to be looking for other things. Okay. So, um, looking for what, uh, Dr. Funky Spoons has been tweeting. Um, again, he's someone who's done research in this field. So let me figure out how to pull this up on screen. Actually, let me just go to Twitter dot com slash Dr. Funky Spoon. He is a singular spoon. All right. Um, it's in big in. I don't want to log in right now. So scrolling down to try and find the beginning of his coverage of this. So here we go. For your reading pleasure, free download of Life on Venus, A Barren Ro World, Chapter 6 from Venus Revealed, um, where I first described why the emerging post-Magellan view of Venus has a plausible biosphere in the clouds. Here's why I've long believed that life in the clouds of Venus is plausible. It's not just that the cloud environment is moderate in temperature and pressure similar to Earth's surface, and it's not that the clouds are a stable and long-lived liquid environment, unlike Earth's ephemeral clouds, which are wispy and discontinuous, the cloud decks of Venus are permanent, deep, stable, and global. And it's not just the ready availability of all the biogenic elements, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, nit nitrogen, sulfa, and other trace elements, including chlorine, magnesium, and iron, and the availability of both chemical and radiative, radiative energy sources to power possible life forms, plenty to eat. It's also the emerging picture of Venus, likely past habitable liquid water oceans for billions of years on the surface, plenty of time to develop a robust, complex, varied, and adaptable biosphere. When the surface dried out, where did the life go? Perhaps the clouds. Also, we're learning Venus, like Earth, has complex geochemical cycles involving interior surface and atmosphere. Volcanoes likely feed gases into the air, which makes clouds 
and are altered by sunlight, cycling back down to react with surface rocks and round and round. This complex chemical cycling creates a fertile environment for biological evolution. On Earth, life surfs along these biogeochemical cycles. Venus has the same active character and thus may be able to support a biosphere. It's true the clouds are composed extremely strong acid, but we keep observing acid acidophile organisms on Earth and we simply don't know the acid limit of life. We really don't know and must keep exploring the entire solar system, but in my honest opinion, life in the clouds of Venus today is at least as plausible as life on the subsurface of Mars. I've been saying this for 23 years. So, um, yeah. And there he retreat, retweets to his chapter, hit to a post, his chapter. Um, and here's an important point. The mechanisms for Jupiter and Saturn do not work for phosphine on Venus. Of course, there may be mechanisms which haven't been through thought of, but the Jovian analogy is not good. That is a highly reducing environment, unlike Venus. So the chemical processes that generate Venus in a cold, high density environment like Jupiter are radically different from the hot, different high density environment of Venus. Um, so yeah. Um, it's so he points out that there's an order of magnitude more scientists warning soberly about the need to not go overboard about the new Venus results than I see people actually going overboard. Um, so, so most people are going to do caveat, caveat, caveat. Um, it's 2020 people. We need something to be excited about. I'm going to be excited about this. Oh, um, that's a stunning image. I don't think I've seen that image before. Let me see if I can get a link to it. So false color photo by JAXA. That's just gorgeous. <laughs> I love when you right click it. It's like, please be respectful of copyright. Um, okay, I'm gonna have to go looking for that image later. Um, so yes, um, so today we're going to cover all of this in the daily space. It's just kind of wild. Um, <laughs> be excited. I'll allow it. I'm glad that you will allow it. I'm glad. Now I have my green screened bottle. Um, mistakes were made. You can't eat, drink Sprite with a green screen. So the daily space is in 35 minutes. Um, yeah, Hex is saying pretty much what I'm feeling that when this idea survives all this criticism, we can take it seriously as a very probable real thing. <sighs> yeah. So trying to figure out just where to start. think where to start is building the slides for today's daily space. Um, let me see if I can get them opened up. I need a different account to do that. Okay. So 
So here I go building the slides for the daily space. And I'm just going to go ahead and open up with the slide um, from Sarah Seeger. I think I screen captured it. Yep, I did. So I'm going to go ahead and open with Sarah Seeger's statement that, oh no, this is a different one. Sorry. Failure to drag. Failure to drag. That's the one I wanted to start with. <sighs> Giving it the context. So I'm doing this out of order. So the next thing I want is to find with permission that gorgeous JAXA picture. So let's see if I can find it. Um, there's so many things going on in the chat. One second and I'll try and catch up. Roman, um, one of his atmospheric, that's stunning. That isn't quite what I'm looking for. Um, oh, my Twitter is a hot mess of so many different topics being discussed simultaneously. Um, I, I agree with what Arnstra is saying that the authors are really challenging people to, um, dogs, are really challenging people to find an explanation that isn't a biosignature. And so far, that hasn't been found. Um, here we go. Here's the JAXA photo I want. line that up at the top. Let's bring that down. I can still make you bigger. Okay, so here's a stunning look at Venus. I can still probably make a little bit bigger. Yeah, I'm going to go with that. Yes, Stella's right here. Come here, baby girl. Come here. She's like, no, I just lay down. I don't want to come here. Um, we are now in the sausage making part of the program. It's true. It's true. Uh, oh, it was an A-pod. That's so where I found it is is somewhere completely different. Um, as so often happens. Yeah, that would be amazing, Ark. That would be amazing. <laughs> how, Adam, how, how do you figure out that it's 87%? How, how do you figure that out? So here's where I found the photo. It's a terrible looking link, but here's where I found the photo. Um, so... I need the life cycle in the Venusian atmosphere. Um, that, I believe, is this screen gab that I did. Yeah. And 
And I think there may be a better paper, not a better paper, a better graphic in the Venus paper that I can grab. I'm going to go looking in just a second. Um, so many windows, so many windows, so many monitors. I'm grateful for the monitors. So many windows. Nature, astronomy, phosphine. This paper may not have the life cycle graphic. Nope, I need to go looking for that. So, um, It's okay. Aha, this is the graphic I want actually. So we're gonna zoom in on this graphic and use this graphic. Here is the source. Beth, if you're here, and this is where I just grabbed that image from. Um, we, are you having fun yet, everyone? Are you having fun yet? Okay, so there's that. All right, so here is where I'm going to try and explain what phosphine is. Hmm. Oh man, Afterwise, I'm sorry that you have class today. Oh, I found the image I really wanted. Sorry, Beth, I'm swapping images on you. Better image incoming. Um, this one is from an article, not where I would have expected it. Not where I would have expected it. Everyone is sharing everything. Um, we okay. So So things that they're hoping for include that phos other phosphine lines will be discovered. Not discovered, but observed. I mean, we know what the lines are. We just don't know if the lines are in Venus's atmosphere. Um, language is confusing people. Um, So phosphine on Earth is occurs in the breakdown of organic ma matter. Um, so it's a byproduct of life. Thank you, Raj, or Raj, A U. Thank you. Oh, I love Australia. I miss being in Australia. Australia is so much saner than our country right now. Now New Zealand. New Zealand is where I want to be. Um, uh, 
Okay. So, there's also been news about dark splotches in the atmosphere. Splotches. Um, Sorry, I opened Twitter to see what was going on and my brain broke at apparently South Dakota's attorney general reported hitting a deer Saturday, but he'd actually killed a human. Always check what you hit, people. Good Lord. All right. Um, I really need to have better lists so that I can filter only the space, although it was a space person who was retweeting it, so that may not have helped. Um, all right, so there's darker splots in Venus's atmosphere. Um, and they affect the weather. So dark patches called unknown observers. I'm trying to I'm trying to put together a whole lot of different information right now. And it's really hard. <laughs> um So there, there was already information that dark patches in Venus's clouds resemble microorganisms in Earth's atmosphere. Um, so there's just a whole lot of different things all pointing towards this together. Trying to find more information on the dark splotches. I need to try and pull up the press release. That's a different window. Um, but I don't want it to be on that screen because I have to search my email. And I love all of you, but I'm not searching my email in front of you. Um, yeah, my streams are crossing on Twitter right now because one of the, the, where did my Google Drive link go? Um, one of the, the poly, poli sci people I follow is now tweeting about Mars and not Mars, about Venus and the planetary science people I follow are tweeting about politics and, um, yeah. The streams are crossing, people. The streams are crossing. And I somehow lost my link to the slides. So let me find that again. Okay. You're watching my brain break in real time. Okay, so I was looking up the Venus Dark Patch press release that we got earlier this year. Venus Dark Patches. I think this is it. Uh, 
Okay, so here's here's what I'm looking at. So there was a press release. There were several press releases. I'm looking at the one from Wisconsin that came out in August of 2019. Um, I mean, big in. So let me look on the word dark. Um, what is curious about Venus's clouds, other than they are unlike anything on Earth, is that in those clouds are mysterious dark patches dubbed unknown absorbers um, by scientists as the tiny particles that make up the patches soak up most of the ultraviolet and some of the visible light. Um, the patches were first observed by ground-based telescopes more than a century ago. They ebb and flow over time, changing their distribution and contrasts. The particles that make up the dark splotches have been suggested to be ferric chloride, allotropes of sulfur, disulfur dioxide, and so on, but none of these so far as we are able to satisfactorily explain their formation and absorption. Um, on the other hand, Lyme notes observations that particles are about the same size and have the same light absorbing properties as microorganisms found in Earth's atmosphere. So here we have another possible in indication. Um, so, so the trick comes, how do we put all of these different things together? And the way, the way you have to eventually put them together is you go and grab a sample. But the question is, how do you go and grab a sample? We're not there yet. We're just not there yet. All right, so let's switch back. I keep, keep killing off the page where I have the slides open because sometimes I am a moron. Okay, let's move you over here. Let's move you over here. So is there a good image from the dark splotch paper? No. Um, So I'm looking to quote the text from the Wisconsin paper, or a press release, rather. My phone is reminding me that we have the daily space starting soon. Um, Today is apparently going to be the day of frantically trying to learn new science. Okay, so, whoa, that did not go as intended. I know, I know, Star Stuff Studio. Um, we so much fun, so much fun. One of my favorite quotes from Firefly is define interesting. And the definition is, oh my God, oh my God, we're all going to die. All right, so pulling the different things together. 
I need to look at my script. I need to check that my teleprompter actually is battery this time. Yes, it does. All right. So So what we're looking at, it builds on so many different things. My uncomfortable look in the silence is because I don't want to screw this up. Today could be the day when humanity says we admitted out loud there could be life on Venus. And this could be the start of a journey that eventually leads to capturing some of that life in a detector on a balloon, looking at it and seeing it divide and undergo respiration and all the other things that life does when you're looking at it under a microscope. And this life could be all that's left of, of an ecosystem that existed 700 million years ago. So one thing I want to look at, timeline of earth life um, let's see if this gets me what I want fine I will take your cookie me cookies but there's no actual cookies involved no I don't want your notifications I want to know what existed 750 million years ago well, we froze, that's what happened. So 800 million years ago, early multicellular animals undergo their first splits. They divide into sponges and everything else. 20 million later, years later, a small group called Placozoa breaks away from the rest. Um, and these are plate-like creatures about one millimeter across. Seven hundred and thirty years ago, million years ago, we had jellyfish. So it is entirely possible that at the point in time that Venus underwent whatever hellscape transition it underwent to become that world we see today, that prior to that there were jellyfish. There were sea sponges living in the oceans of this world. This is such a different picture from what we're used to. This is wild. Okay. So daily space is going to start in 10 minutes. I need to work on polishing things up. Um, those of you who need a second cup of coffee, now is the time to go get it. Um, I'm going to return in 10 minutes and we're going to do the daily space. For now, I'm going to switch on over. Um, let me just add some text. So, um, let 
I'm working to add countdown clock. Let me get this set correctly. Okay, so we're going to go to rockets in just a moment. Sorry, I'm running a new setup, which hopefully means better video quality, but also I'm still setting stuff up. All right, I'm gonna go to Rockets and I will be back in 10 minutes, hopefully with a more collected version of our show. Um, here we go, people, here we go.